Today's tax meeting is the last in a series of our training sessions on the BEPS Pillar 2 model rules. And today we'll be focusing on the charging mechanisms. So these are the mechanisms that actually collect the top up tax that we calculated in previous sessions. There are two charging mechanisms under the model rules. The first one, the primary charging mechanism, is the income inclusion rule or the IIR. And this is a top-down rule that levies top-up tax on parent entities by reference to their ownership interest in the low-taxed constituent entity. We'll come on to the meaning of that definition in a minute. The secondary charging mechanism is a sweep-up rule, and this is the undertaxed payment rule, or UTPR. Rather confusingly, there is no need for there to be an undertax payment. Indeed, there's not even any need for there to be a payment. Instead, the rule works by charging the top up tax to um, group members that are in jurisdictions where there are employees and or tangible assets. And if there's one message to take away from this session, it is that the income inclusion rule is good and the UTPR is bad. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the charging mechanism rules, I thought it'd be useful if we had a refresher on a few key definitions. Starting off with the defi definition of group, there's no legal ownership threshold or control test here. The test for a group is wholly an accounting one. So you look to see which entities are included in the consolidated financial statements of the ultimate parent entity. Next definition is that of controlling interest. And an entity will have a controlling interest where it holds an ownership interest in another entity and it is required by an appropriate accounting standard to consolidate the income, assets and so on of that entity on a line by line basis. We now need to look at the meaning of ownership interest, and that is an equity interest that carries rights to profits, capital or reserves of an entity. Note that the equity interest doesn't need to carry any voting rights there. Uh, it can carry rights to profits, capital or reserves, and if a mixture of these, those can be in different percentages. What is an equity interest? Well, that's something that is accounted for as equity under the relevant accounting standard. The next definition is ultimate parent entity or UPE. An entity will be a UPE where it owns a direct or indirect controlling interest in another entity. And secondly, another entity doesn't hold a controlling interest in it. The next definition is Intermediate Parent Entity, or IPE. This definition will be in play where a constituent entity owns directly or indirectly an ownership interest in another constituent entity. And the first constituent entity is not the UPE not a partially owned parent entity, we'll come on to that definition, not a permanent establishment and not an investment entity. The next definition is cons constituent entity. An entity will be a constituent entity if it is a member of the group and if it is not an excluded entity. So things like investment funds and so on, uh, if they meet the definition of investment fund, then they won't be um, constituent entities because they are types of ex excluded entity. The last definition is low tax constituent entity. And this is a constituent entity located in a low tax jurisdiction or a stateless constituent entity. A stateless constituent entity is certain types of um, flow through entities and permanent establishments. A low tax jurisdiction is a jurisdiction which has a net globe income, so the jurisdiction as a whole is not loss making, and the jurisdiction has an effective tax rate below the minimum rate of 15%. In order to be a low tax constituent entity, 
as well as being located in the low tax jurisdiction or being a stateless constituent entity, the constituent entity itself must have globe income and it must be subject to an effective tax rate lower than the minimum rate of 15%. Let's look now at how the income inclusion rule actually works. So we're going to start with the basic or default rule and then we'll move on to special rule for partially owned parent entities. The IIR is usually a top down rule. So one starts with the UPE and you need to work your way down to a jurisdiction that has implemented an IIR. The first charge is on the UPE and that's at article 2.11 and this applies where the UPE holds an ownership interest in a low tax constituent entity at some point in the fiscal year and the UPE is located in a jurisdiction that has implemented the IIR. So because it needs to have held the interest at some point in the fiscal year, it applies even if the UP has acquired or disposed of the interest in the low tax constituent entity during the fiscal year. There is a parallel charge on intermediate parent entities at Article 2.1.2. And this again applies where the IP has held an ownership interest in the low tax constituent entity at some point in the fiscal year and the IP is located in a jurisdiction that has implemented the income inclusion rule. This parallel charge is disapplied if either the ultimate parent entity or an intermediate parent entity that is higher up the chain is required to apply the IIR. Now, the higher IPE must hold a controlling interest in the lower IPE in order for there to be disapplication under this rule. And if this test is not met, then that means that the IIR can be applied by more than one intermediate parent entity in the group. Note that the percentage interest held by the intermediate parent entity is irrelevant to the question of whether or not there is a charge. However, it will be taken into account when assessing the quantum of the charge. So even if the intermediate parent entity only holds a 10% um, interest in the low tax constituent entity, because it might be that um, other interests in that entity are held by other group members. E even if that interest is that low, there could still be an IPE charge. In the example on the slide, the charge could apply to the ultimate parent entity, uh, IPE1 and IPE2, depending on which jurisdictions have implemented the income inclusion rule. So if the UPE jurisdiction has not implemented an income inclusion rule, but the jurisdiction in which IPE1 and IPE2 have implemented such a rule, you would have a charge on IPE1, but not on IPE2. And that's because um, that lower down charge would be knocked out because a higher IPE is required to apply the IIR. And let's assume here that everything is owned 100%. That higher IPE holds a controlling interest in IPE2. So that would result in the charge being knocked out. We're now going to look at some special rules that apply where there is a partially owned parent entity or Pope in the structure. A partially owned parent entity is a constituent entity other than a UPE that holds an ownership interest in another constituent entity and more than 20% of the ownership interests in the first constituent entity's profits are directly or indirectly held by persons outside the group. So in the example on the slide, both Pope 1 and Pope 2 are Popes because 25% of their interests, assume that the interests carry a right to 25% of the profits, are held by persons outside of the group. The rationale for departing from the top-down approach is that it enables the collection of more tax 
So in this example, if you were to collect tax at the level of the ultimate parent entity, this would be restricted to 750 or 75% of the thousand of top up tax that is owed in relation to the low tax constituent entity. And that's because the tax charge reflects the ownership interest. We're going to come on to this. However, if instead you collect at the Pope level, you can recover 100% of the top up tax. Note that the Pope charge is disapplied if the Pope is wholly owned by a higher up Pope. That's under Article 2.1.5. So in this example, there would be no Pope charge for Pope 2 as it is wholly owned by Pope 1. Assuming that all the jurisdictions have on this example have implemented an income inclusion rule, there will of course be a charge on the ultimate parent entity as well. And this double taxation issue is dealt with under the IIR offset mechanism, which gives the Pope charge priority and cancels out um, tax due under the UPE charge. The next thing I wanted to point out is that under the model rules, the parent entity is actually only required to apply the income inclusion rule where the low tax constituent entities are located in different jurisdictions to it. So if there is a low tax constituent entity in the same jurisdiction as the parent entity, or perhaps the parent entity is itself a low tax constituent entity, then under the model rules, the income inclusion rule would not apply and that tax would need to be picked up under the undertaxed payment rule. However, the commentary says that the implementing jurisdiction can depart from that and collect top up taxes attributable to domestic low tax constituent entities and uh, the parent entity itself. Now that we know who will be paying tax under the income inclusion rule, Let's look at how much tax that entity will be paying. Top up tax that is payable under the income inclusion rule is restricted by reference to the relevant parent entity's interest in the low tax constituent entity. And one might have thought that in looking at the parent entity's interest, you would simply take uh, the, their percentage shareholding in the low tax constituent entity and multiply that by the low tax constituent entity's top up tax liability. Not so. Instead, we've got a different mechanism which uses accounting principles. So the amount that is paid under the income inclusion rule is called the allocable share. And the allocable share is the top up tax of the low tax constituent entity multiplied by the parent entity's inclusion ratio. The inclusion ratio is the ratio of A, the low tax constituent entity's globe income, less the share of that globe income that is attributable to minority interests, to B, the low tax constituent entity's globe income. And you use hypothetical consolidated accounts to assess the amount that is attributable to minority owners. Why use hypothetical accounts? Why can't you just use the existing financial accounts? Well, there are three reasons. First reason is that you are apportioning globe income, not financial accounting net income. The second reason is that if you have a parent entity other than the ultimate parent entity, so if we're looking at an IPE or a Pope, then that entity may not be preparing consolidated accounts. And the third reason is that you need to apply different principles in drawing up these hypothetical accounts. So which principles do you apply? Firstly, you need to apply the ultimate parent entity's financial accounting standard. Secondly, you need to consolidate the interest in the low tax constituent entity on a line by line basis, even if the parent entity holds a minority interest and wouldn't be required to consolidate under the relevant accounting standard. The third principle is that you treat all income of the low tax constituent entity as coming from third parties. 
so you wouldn't eliminate any income from intergroup transactions. And fourthly, you treat all ownership interests that are held by persons other than the parent entity as held by third parties. So even if those interests are held by other persons within the group, they would be treated for these purposes as though they were held by third parties. So it's a rather painful process, but it should result in an allocable share that in essence reflects the parent entity's ownership interest in the LTCE. The final thing to consider on the IIR is the offset mechanism. And this is a mechanism to prevent double taxation, which would otherwise arise from potential multiple levels of IIR charges. The mechanism applies where the parent entity owns an ownership interest through an IPE or perhaps a POPE that is itself required to apply the IIR. And what one does is reduce the parent entity's top up tax liability by the IPE or indeed the Pope's allocable share. The mechanism applies when the top up tax is allocated to the IPE or Pope. So it doesn't require the IPE or Pope to actually pay the top up tax. In the example, both IPE1 and IPE2 are required to apply an income inclusion rule charge because they're both located in IIR jurisdictions and they both hold an interest in an LTCE. IPE2's um, IIR charge is not knocked out by um, the fact that there is also an IIR charge at the level of IPE1. And that's because IPE1 only holds a 40% interest in IPE2, whereas to have a knockout, it would need to hold a controlling interest. So you've got two charges going on. Because IPE1 holds its interest through IPE2 and IPE2 is required to also apply the IIR, then you have got the conditions satisfied for the IIR offset mechanism. So how does it actually work? Well, IPE1's allocable share is 400. And that's because the LTCE has got a top up tax liability of 1000 and you deduct from that the 600, which is attributable to UPE's indirect interest in the LTCE. IPE2's allocable share is the full 1000, and that's because it holds a 100% interest in the LTCE. So that um, share that you've got at IPE2 level will actually cancel out in full IPE1's um, top up tax liability under the income inclusion rule. Let's look now at the under tax payment rule or UTPR. We'll start by looking at how much is payable in social under the UTPR. The UTPR top up tax amount is actually the total top up tax for all the LTCEs in the group. So one applies the same rules to calculate the top up tax as one did under the IIR. The key difference here though is that there is no restriction by reference to percentage ownership interest in the relevant LTCE. There are however two offset mechanisms that take into account the fact that some of this tax um, has probably been paid under the income inclusion rule, which of course takes priority to the UTPR. The first offset mechanism applies where all of the UPE's interests in the low tax constituent entity are held through IIR jurisdictions. In this case, the UTPR top up tax amount is reduced to zero. So in the example on the slide, the ultimate parent entity holds an indirect 85% interest in LTCE. Although UPE is not in an income inclusion rule jurisdiction, the intermediate parent entity or IPE is, and the 850 top up tax is picked up in the jurisdiction in which IPE is located under the income inclusion rule. 
Because all of the UPE's interests are held through an IIR jurisdiction, the UTEPR top-up tax amount is reduced to zero. So there's no pickup of the remaining 150, which is attributable to the 15% uh, minority interest in LTCE. The second offset mechanism is where all of the UPE's interests in the LTCE are not all held through income inclusion rule jurisdictions. In this situation, the UTPR top-up amount is reduced by the amount that has been brought into a charge under the income inclusion rule. So you'll see that you need to assess these offset mechanisms on an entity by entity basis because you need to assess for each low tax constituent entity whether it is held uh, via an income inclusion rule jurisdiction. Let's look in more detail at the situation where the ultimate parent entity's interests in the low tax constituent entity are not all held through income inclusion rule jurisdictions. So here, the UTPR top up tax amount is reduced by the income inclusion rule charge. So what this does is leave within charge low taxed income, which is beneficially owned by persons that are outside the MNE group. In this example on the slide, the first offset mechanism does not apply, and that's because the UPE's interests in the LTCE are not all held through IIR jurisdictions. So you've got the remaining 35% interest that is held directly by UPE is not held through an IIR jurisdiction. So the reduction of the UTPR top-up tax amount is by the amount that has been picked up by the income inclusion rule in the IPE jurisdiction. So that's the 500, which is attributable to the 50% interest in the top-up tax of 1,000. The remaining UTPR top-up tax amount is in fact 500. It is not 350, and that's because there is no restriction by reference to the fact that UPE only holds 35%, um, not the remaining 50%. And this gets really punitive where the low tax constituent entity is a minority owned constituent entity. For example, if in the above um, example, UPE held 5% and IPE held 30%, there would only be a 300 reduction, leaving 700 UTPR top up tax amount, even though 650 of that would be attributable to income beneficially owned by persons outside the MNE group. This is not a drafting mistake, this is entirely deliberate. And the rationale given for this is that it simplifies application of the rule and also that it allows for um, collection of a larger amount of tax. But really, this is another reason why you don't want to be in UTPR territory if you can avoid being in it. So now that we know how much is going to be brought into account under the UTPR, how is it actually charged? Well, the choice is given to the implementing jurisdiction. Option one is the denial of a deduction. This deduction in no way needs to be linked to the low taxed entity. So there doesn't need to be in a payment made to that entity. And one calculates the deduction by dividing the UTPR top up tax amount allocated to the entity in question by the tax rate in that jurisdiction. For example, if you have allocated a UTPR top up tax amount of 10 and the corporate income tax uh, in that jurisdiction is 25%, then 10 divided by 25% would give you a denied deduction of 40. Now, it's important to note that the deduction can't already be subject to a separate limitation. So you couldn't deny a deduction where that deduction was already um, reduced by something like the interest restriction. Option two is some sort of alternative adjustment that results in a cash tax expense. 
And that cash tax expense can be in the current year or it could be in following years. For example, if there were insufficient profits in year one, you might need to look to year two and so on to um, get that top up tax paid. And this option must result in an increase of the amount that the constituent entity pays under domestic rules for calculating taxable income. A reduction to loss carry forward is allowed, but that won't actually result in additional cash tax expense until subsequent income arises that would otherwise have been sheltered by that loss carry forward. There is also a carry forward mechanism, and this kicks in if the first adjustment that was made didn't result in a cash tax expense that is equivalent to the allocated UTPR top up tax amount. So if that's the case, you can make subsequent adjustments in the next or later years. For example, if uh, losses can't be carried forward under local rules and the denial of a deduction pushed the relevant constituent entity into a loss making position, uh, you would need to make a further adjustment to get the allocated UTPR top up tax amount in full. And this carry forward mechanism applies even if the group is no longer in the scope of pillar two, for example, if it no longer meets the revenue threshold. So you would still have to keep collecting the tax in that scenario. You potentially might even need to keep collecting tax from an entity, even if that entity has left the MNE group in question. And here, implementing jurisdictions um, will be given the flexibility to decide whether the top up tax liability that has been allocated to a constituent ent entity under the UTPR and that entity leaves the group. Jurisdictions will have the ability to choose whether that liability should remain with the entity or be reallocated to other entities in the seller group. The guiding principle is that the maximum amount must be collected as early as possible. But the problem here is that groups might not know how much UTPR top up tax amount has been allocated to an entity until after the due date for the tax return to be filed for that entity. And the reason for that is that the globe tax return is not due until 15 months after the end of the fiscal year in question. So the entity might have to amend a tax return that's already been filed, or perhaps the um, charge could be applied in the following year. And the commentary says that there would be no penalties in that scenario. So now that we know how much tax is going to be paid under the UTPR and how that tax is going to be paid, the next thing to consider is who is going to be paying it. And this is really a two step process. Step one is to allocate the UTPR top up tax amount between jurisdictions. And step two is for jurisdictions to allocate the amount that they have been allocated in between entities in that jurisdiction. So let's look at step one first. The UTPR top up tax amount will be allocated to jurisdictions that have implemented the UTPR and have employees and or tangible assets. So once again, there is no requirement for a connection or ownership interest in the LTCEs whose tax is being allocated. And it is allocated according to the UTPR percentage for that jurisdiction. The UTPR percentage is made up of 50% of the employees in the relevant jurisdiction divided by the total employees in UTPR jurisdictions added to 50% of the tangible assets in the jurisdiction divided by the total tangible assets in UTPR jurisdictions. A few points to note here. First thing is that the definition of employees is different to the definition of employees in the substance based carve out. Um, here we are looking at the number of full time equivalent employees of constituent entities that are tax resident in the jurisdiction. So you don't need to look at where the employees are actually working. 
the definition of tangible assets is also broader than the definition of eligible tangible assets under the substance based carve out. The assets in question need to be owned by constituent entities um, tax resident in the jurisdiction. There are special rules for um, investment entities and um, flow through entities. You don't allocate anything to jurisdictions that haven't yet recovered the UTPR top up tax that they were allocated for a previous year. In that situation, their UTPR top up tax percentage is deemed to be zero. And so you would exclude employees and tangible assets from um, these sorts of jurisdictions from the total amounts in the um, formula to calculate the UTPR percentage for other jurisdictions. So this is an annual test. And once a jurisdiction has caught up and captured the allocated tax, it goes back into the formula. One important caveat to this, though, is that if all the UTPR jurisdictions haven't yet recovered the prior allocated tax, for example, because the group is loss making in all those jurisdictions, then that um, special rule doesn't apply. So let's have a quick look at this example. By way of reminder, in order for there to be an allocation to a jurisdiction, the jurisdiction needs to have implemented the UTPR and have employees and or tangible assets. Low tax jurisdictions can actually be allocated top up tax under the UTPR under this um, if, if they meet this criteria. In this example, each of the entities are in a different jurisdiction and you would allocate UTPR top up tax to um, LTCE and also to CE3. And that's because they're both resident in jurisdictions where the UTPR has been implemented and they have the requisite substance. The last thing to consider is how the amount allocated to a jurisdiction is allocated between entities in that jurisdiction. And implementing jurisdictions are given the choice of how to make this allocation subject to the guiding principle that they must collect the maximum amount as early as possible. Let's look at profitable versus loss making entities. Well, an implementing jurisdiction is going to have to allocate to profitable entities in order to recover the amount faster. What about wholly owned versus minority entities? Here, the commentary gives the implementing jurisdiction the choice to treat wholly owned or nearly wholly owned entities differently to partially owned entities due to the difficulties of minority owners bearing some of the economic burden of top up taxes which have arisen in LTCEs, which the minority owners didn't have an interest in. Will implementing jurisdictions give groups the flexibility to decide how to apportion the UTPR top up tax themselves? Possibly, but of course not if that were to impact the speed at which and the amount of the tax that is collected. And that is the end of this training session. <laughs>